My name is John Harrington. I'm, uh, um, I work over in Norfolk uh, at Ch uh, Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. That's right, yeah. And um, to today we're interviewing Temple Grandin, a well-known author and uh, expert in autism. And um, our first, uh, we're going to do it as a question and answer. Some of these questions were submitted to me, uh, and yeah. some of them are, are my own uh, and stuff, and some of friends and stuff. So the first one was really related to sleep and whether or not um, sleeping is something that you ever struggled with, and if if um, if so, how did you handle that? And then also, yeah, okay, how, do you, how do you talk about that? Yeah, how do you how do you um, how do you help other parents who explain that their child has difficulty sleeping? Uh, their au child with autism has difficulty sleeping. I just wondered. Well, if maybe I ought to just in, you know introduce myself a little bit and sure. then get right into talking about sleep. Well, I'm Temple Grandin. I'm a mm -hmm. professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Been there now 30 years, good long time. Understand the first question is about sleep. Yes, I didn't, I had some trouble with sleeping. And what my mother had for a rule was I could um, read with the reading light on as long as I wanted to, but I couldn't be running around. And I had to get up the next morning in time for school. And that's basically how she handled it. The rule is stay on the bed, reading light only. And I... Uh, even now, I sometimes have some nights where I don't sleep that well, and then the next night I'll sleep. Now, I have found that one of the things that helps me is making sure I do vigorous exercise every day, sit-ups, mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do this burst of physical exercise every day, then I have a really bad time with sleeping. So how many, how many, how many sit-ups do you do? 100. <laughs> you do them in sets of 100 or just 100 and that's enough? I do 100 and that's enough. It's just a burst of, of hard exercise. Now, I, it took me almost six months to work up to that. Mm -hmm. When I started, it was like three. <laughs> uh, so you've got to work up to it. But a short burst of hard exercise. So now, I, now, my flights have all been canceled since uh, March. Um, and... Airport walking, I mean, I added up, uh, you know, I'm going to walk a mile in the airport. Yeah. That didn't seem to do it because it's not enough exertion. What worked for me was this burst of hard exercise. I great. have so, to do yeah. it. That's awesome. I think that's a great thing. You, like really hard, vigorous exercise in, is much better to get you tired than, than, you know, sort of this long walk type thing. Well, that doesn't work. And I'm still out doing my long, I do a, now having good, can't go anywhere. I walk around the condo complex. That's a quarter of a mile. Do that every day. Just keep my back good. Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. doesn't have an effect on, on, uh, on sleeping. It's the burst of hard exercise. Yeah. Short you, burst. You, you talked about reading. What have you, how do you deal with the digital devices now? Those things seem, seem to call, you know, have that glow of light and some other things. Do you, do you tell parents not to use, definitely not? Well, it's best that. not to use those at night. But um, what I'm saying, a lot of kids, even before the COVID hit, getting addicted to video games. Yeah. And I'm seeing the older kids, it's kind of two paths. They go down, go to the basement to play video games or get out and get a job. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the big things I'm really pushing now you know, especially on the fully verbal kids, is before they graduate from high school, I'd like them to have two real jobs. So the transitioning to work starts before they graduate. When I was in high school, I was running the school's horse barn. Nine stalls every day, I cleaned them. Put them in and out, fed them. Learning work skills, it's a major big area. Because I'm seeing an awful lot of granddads come up to me uh, the conferences mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they discover they have autism when the kids get diagnosed and granddaddy had a good job because granddaddy had a paper route you see this is the learning work skills is one of the that's one of my really big things i like to talk about do you do you find that there are any limitations in terms of um the child themselves or the adolescent themselves in terms of getting a job is there anything specific that you would tell them if there's a limitation in terms of their language function and well they well it depends but i mean they interview badly the way i learned how to do interviews was simply show my work off mm -hmm. when i first started out i'd show off i first thing i was doing in high school I was painting signs mm -hmm. well i had a little portfolio of signs i painted mm -hmm. oh, and then yeah. when i went into doing the designing cattle handling facilities i've got a portfolio of um uh, drawings, I'd show off my drawings. In other mm -hmm. words, what I learned to do 
was to sell my work mm -hmm. rather than myself. So I just finding... put out the pictures and the drawings and just show off the things I had designed. So basically finding did. finding what you were good at, what your skill right. was, and then you know, shoot using that to derive the job just you know, your job. And honestly. then I would show off pictures, trade magazine articles. Mm -hmm. I basically would just show the work. Mm -hmm. That was an interview. A lot of these kids interview really poorly. Mm -hmm. But another problem I'm running into now, which was not a problem with me, is just things like getting to work on time. Get up, get on work on time. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, making sure. And I've heard of high-level people with law degrees and other advanced degrees getting fired from jobs because they simply can't get there on time. <laughs> and this is where a 50s upbringing was helpful for me. Yeah. I was taught to be on time. That was never an issue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tack back a little bit. So um, some of the kids um, early on and then later on, um, we talk about medications and, and I call it psychopharmacology or ph pharmacology and stuff like that. And I know in some of your previous talks, you've talked about medications helping you move through different periods of time for you and stuff like that. So could you mention some of the things that you think help you to decide whether or not you need a medicine or whether or not you can do it through behavioral stuff and things like that. I think well, that's a, I, uh, I, I think way too many medications are just given out to kids like candy. I've done a lot of talks in, in some, of, especially some of the low income areas and I'll have a kid on five or six drugs. I talked to the parents. There was absolutely no thought went into it. They were just throwing prescriptions and stuff. It was disgusting. Now, when I got into puberty, I started having horrendous anxiety, mm -hmm. just horrendous mm -hmm. and vigorous exercise helped it. As I got into my 20s, it got worse. Then I was getting all kinds of stress-related health problems. Mm -hmm. and, and then I read an article about antidepressant medications and, and anxiety when I was in my, uh, just I turned about right around 29 or 30. It was called The Promise of Biological Psychiatry, and it was in a Psychology Today. Mm -hmm. And it described people with extreme anxiety taking a low dose of antidepressants. So I went and I looked up the original articles in the library mm -hmm. and I read the list of symptoms in this article and I'm going, that sounds like me. And I kind of resisted the idea of taking medication. And then I had to have an eye surgery that I got really, really stressed out about to take mm -hmm. a little tiny cancer off my eyelid mm -hmm. and you do it conscious. You're awake for this. <laughs> it's not fun. And, and I, I then went on a low dose of a mipramine, very low dose and three days later, the anxiety was greatly diminished. And I've written about that extensively in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. In my book, Thinking in Pictures, I've got a chapter called um, The Believer in Biochemistry. And the colitis cleared up. I've been on, on that drug now for over 40 years, since mm -hmm. 1980. Wow. And it basically saved me. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to other people uh, that have extreme high, high, high anxiety, you know, taking a little dose of Prozac. And that's been, that's been really, really helpful. And the mistake I see get made is he works great on a low dose. They give him a higher dose and all heck breaks loose with mm -hmm. agitation and insomnia. I've probably had a hundred parents tell me that little horror story mm -hmm. of uh, taking uh, too high a dose doesn't work for anxiety. Mm -hmm. I had my brain scanned as part of an experimental research and they found out my amygdala or fear center was three times larger than normal. Yeah. I don't think behavioral would work. This was biology. <laughs> yeah. And as I got through my 20s, it got worse. It was tearing me apart physically. Mm -hmm. Colitis, um, everything was going through me. That's why I was eating yogurt and jello in the movie. Yeah. yeah. And then that cleared up when I went on the medication. I've been mm -hmm. on it ever since. And the only side effects, then I got to drink a lot of water. I take uh, 50 milligrams of disipramine, mm -hmm. um, old tricyclic every night, take it at night. And I'm... Uh, I don't plan to go off it. I, I've seen too many people when they've been stable go off of meds and it's been a complete disaster when they've yeah. been on the right meds and then they go off them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's way too much stuff just indiscriminately given out to young kids, you know, atypical antipsychotics. And the thing that ho really horrifies me when I discuss it with the parents mm -hmm. is they didn't really put any thought into it. Yeah. So they throw like two prescriptions at once at them. Mm -hmm. You know, you ought to try one thing at a time and see what happens. There's no thought went into it. Yeah, they just they just yeah. were writing prescriptions, or now they just type them on a the computer. And mm -hmm. and I was like, it's just appalling. And you know, usually the low income kids, 
fill them up with drugs. I just talked to a teacher yesterday, mm-hmm. and she's got a kid in her class that's like sleeping in class. He's on so many meds. Yeah. And it's in a low-income area. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think a lot of times uh, people do start more than one medicine at a time, and, and I, you know, we disagree with that in most cases. Right. We want to do one at a time, watch the behaviors, see if that's it helps right. the behaviors or not. Um, that is definitely good advice for most of the practitioners. Well, and I, they, I mean, I can't be against medication because a medic, one little tiny med, it saved me. And okay. I, I have a whole chapter in this book where I describe my experiences. Mm-hmm. And I, you see, that's the thing. You see, you use it right conservatively. It's really valuable. And then you use it wrong and these kids are falling asleep in this teacher's class. Mm-hmm. That's not acceptable. I'm gonna I'm gonna change gears just a little bit. So, like with COVID nineteen, even with your own life, um, you know things have changed kind of dramatically, and there's been a lot of new transitions and stuff. And so, I just wondered how you currently organize your day for COVID, and and what strategies you use currently to like live independently, like you do. Well, I had to get on a schedule. Get up in the morning, get dressed, get dressed for work by seven o'clock in the morning, every day, and. Um, I tell parents you might want to look at life on the International Space Station videos because they have to live in a very, very tight environment. There's now seven astronauts up there, and they've got to get along, and they wake them up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you know, well, Houston Mission Control, that's morning. Mm -hmm. And um, get dressed. They have their chores, their scientific experiments. They have to exercise for two hours a day, and they have a midday meal. Everybody has to be at that. Mm -hmm. They also schedule free time. And they learned kind of the hard way what happened before they scheduled free time. On the original Skylab, the astronauts got angry and turned off mission control. And a similar thing happened on one of the Russian stations. Um, Both NASA and the Russian Space Agency have learned you need a schedule. And Scott Kelly, who spent a year up there, you need a schedule. You got to get up. You cannot be floating around in your underpants, sleeping in late. And I have found that that's really made a difference. You've got to get up, get dressed for work. Right when COVID first started, I was wearing just complete slouchy stuff. I stopped doing that. (laughs) And when I do a Zoom conference, I may be in my kitchen, but I got the same clothes on I'd wear if I was there live at the conference. Oh, that's great. I'll admit that the shoes are not the same, but <laughs> the, rest of the outfit is. I won't have you stand up. I won't have you stand no, up. Well, you won't see me if I do stand up. <laughs> okay. Um, so t- taking that further, so um, in terms of uh, things and stuff, what, what do you sort of um, consider, like, you know, do you think, you know, we'll go back to sort of doing everything we were doing before or – you know, how do, how do we decide to do that transition or how are you going to decide to do that transition? When do you think that you'll feel safe enough to do that? Well, I think we got to get a lot. of people got to get vaccinated and that's yeah. not going to happen overnight. They just can't manufacture the stuff fast enough. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think is going to happen uh, is the big conventions are going to come back. Yeah. People want to get together. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that people really want is just, um, you know, casual conversations with the colleagues at the office. I can't just go into the office now at school and just talk with the other professors there. You know, now they've got, you know, more of a lockdown right now. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that's just, Zoom is not going to replace that. But then on the other hand, I think there's some travel that's going to get reduced. Right now, business travel is dead. My travel agency had to give up her nice office in the bank building and work out of her house because she couldn't pay the rent on the bank building. Uh, The cruise, a lot of the leisure cruises that they did, that's all dead. But business travel is completely dead. Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, they used to be, okay, salesperson would get on a plane and just go see a client. I think there's going to be less of that. You would get on a plane for the initial visit. Mm -hmm. I, but I think there's a lot of, um, I'm on a lot of committees on animal welfare with different corporations Mm-hmm. I think more of those are going to be virtual now. Uh, instead of getting us all in there around the conference table, mm-hmm. I but there's certain big conventions. I that's going to stay. Trade shows online are useless. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, 
uh, this January, they canceled the big international food show. Just got a complete, they um, canceled it completely. Our big national cattlemen's is going to um, August and mm-hmm. a huge big veterinary conference VMX they're going to do in June. Okay. Because the vendors just said, no, virtual is like worthless for us. Right. Right. They did that for the PAS meeting, which is our pediatric academic society as well. So, um, well, because for your trade show, it's completely useless. Yeah. And then they, and then the other thing, the reason why Zoom took over is because the, the interface is easy to use. Our animal science meetings, well, I couldn't even get into half the sessions. The platform was so awful. Yeah. So here's something that I think um, a lot of parents are sort of uh, dealing with and stuff. Students who do return to schools must wear masks and are often still socially distanced from their peers and not able to get normal social interactions. So what do you see as the side effects of the pandemic in terms of social distancing and and kids on the spectrum or people on the spectrum? Well, the masks, you have to wear them and let's give them choices. There's tons of choices tons and tons of choices of masks Mm -hmm. and you are going to have to wear one Mm -hmm. and you got to keep it over your nose, but you're going to have a choice. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of these kids, you give them, you give them some choice. Also, we're going to practice wearing it at home until you're totally used to it. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, the other thing that you do. Mm -hmm. So practice, have them practice. In other words, the, one of the basic principles is it should not be a surprise. Mm-hmm. It isn't like, oh yeah, we got we're at the airport now. We got to wear a mask. Don't do that. No, you, this needs to be practiced. Also, on the social distancing, go back to school and the chairs are all apart. Well, they need to look at videos of that, so it's not a surprise. And then explain why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. You, the whole principle is not a surprise. I've been telling families for years. Okay, let's say back when uh, everybody was going on the airport, and a lot of people are still going to the airport. I'm not. Mm-hmm. Because all my trips were, bit, were, you know, meetings, and they've all been either virtual, postponed, or canceled. Um, you don't want to get the kid into the airport, and now all of a sudden the security guards are going to touch them. Right. You do not want to have that kind of a surprise. Right. No. Right. You show them the videos. You practice some of this stuff at home. So it's not a surprise. Yes. Yeah, so actually, some of the airlines have set that up in some of the airports and stuff. Have set That's up good. Like- that's things good. Where you can practice done. it and stuff and go through. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's really good because that's going to prevent a lot of problems mm-hmm. when it's not a surprise. Yeah. Do you, so some of the kids with autism, I mean, they're basically not upset with the fact that they can stay home, right? That they don't have it's to have on to the deal kid, with the kids. I'm really concerned about the little kids. Yeah. You know, I had excellent one on one speech therapy when I was, uh, you know, two and a half, three years old. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, um, I, you know, little kid, how would you, your kid doesn't work online. All you can do is coach the parents or somebody else how to do it online. And I'm concerned about little kids in general not being in school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, right now, I, I know this meeting is, uh, you know, a month and a half from when I've talked, but I don't think everybody's going to be vaccinated in a month and a half. Yeah. And, uh, your kids. <laughs> and, and little kids are hardly even get it. You know, they're, much milder, but let's vaccinate the teachers with a little kids, low income areas, get them back in that classroom. Cause I just talked to a second grade teacher two weeks ago. Oh, excuse me. That would now be uh, two <laughs> months ago. Yeah. And uh, a second grade teacher, regular ed teacher in a low income area, half her kids are not logging on at all. Yeah. That is terrible. And then she calls the parents and there's no answer. That kid needs to be back in the classroom. Yeah. We, we, I mean, I, I see kids every day and um, it is, I think it's fatigue. I mean, I think they've been doing this now for so long and the parent has been sort of shuffling back and forth from work and there's not always oversight of the kids at home. Well, that's the problem. And, mm-hmm. and I think the younger kids, like right where I live across the street, there's a nursery school and they've got about a sixty percent of their kids back. I just love seeing the little kids they're playing. I keep you know away from the fence, so I'm socially distanced, but I can see them there playing, and it's uh, uh, doing normal little kid play. You know, little two two year olds, three year olds, four year olds over there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really important. 
you know, I was a goof off student in high school. I basically <laughs> didn't study for three years and I made it up. And I, Mr. Patey, the headmaster of my boarding school, and so let her get to her ad lessons. And so I was running that horse barn instead of studying, mm -hmm. but I was learning how to work. But that I made up. But when I was a little kid, you know, let's say COVID had something like that had been around when I was a real little kid, that would have been terrible. Yeah. So, so I, it sounds like the kind of accommodations to get COVID and to get public school back in, in order would be to vaccinate the teachers. And, well, yeah, and then because the teachers are, the, you know, a lot of teachers are older. They're afraid to go back in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I, you look at where some of the stuff is spread. One thing that's been good at Colorado State, they've been having the labs in person and the freshman classes in person all spread out in the biggest lecture halls they can find. And it hasn't been spread around there. It's mm -hmm. parties is where it's been spread around. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the grocery store just very, very recently. And a young boy in his 20s had a whole shopping cart full of beer. And mm -hmm. that's all that was in this whole piled up shopping cart. <laughs> yeah. So um, getting into, it sounds like um, some of the things uh, we've already kind of touched on some of these questions, but what are your thoughts on how parents can help create safe opportunities to interact with pairs, peers at this point in time? You know, well, I think a lot of families, you know, get together with a couple of other families, sort of form a pod. And I, I, because kids have got to get socialization. So you definitely get them socializing somehow, even if it's. In well, yeah, we're going to have to. I mean, do you just, the th other thing is even before COVID came on the scene, um, there's little kids that live here in my neighborhood and um, they're maybe 10 years old. The only time they're allowed to use the scooters is when the parents are outside. When I was 10 years old, we would have been right all over the whole neighborhood with those scooters. And I see that there's kids that live here that uh, don't do anything outside. And that's before COVID, too. There's a whole apartment complex on the right by where I live. I didn't even know there were little kids in those buildings until I saw the school bus one day at 3.30. Mm -hmm. And normally I'm not over there at 3.30 because I'd be in the office. Yeah. It, it's true. I mean, I think there's a lot of issue with, you know, parents being fearful of even having their kids outside. Well, that's the problem. And, and I, uh, I, uh, when we were kids in the fifties, the way the fifties was is kids ran free out in the woods, you know, building stuff, uh, collecting insects, doing all kinds of stuff. Then when we came in for sit down meals, we were taught manners. So the fifties was a real freedom outside to do stuff. And the parents kept an eye on it to make sure we weren't doing something really dangerous. They kind of left us just to, you know, um, play in the woods and out in the fields, fly my kite in the field. Did that all the time. Go across the street to the field and fly my kite. I was like seven years old. Did that by myself. But then when we came in for meals, and this was typical 50s, sit down uh, meals. Uh, uh, if I reached for the serving dish, mother would say, ask your sister to pass it. If I stirred my drink with my finger, she'd say, use the spoon. They would give the instructions. Social skills were taught in a much more structured way. That's yeah, not no, I, it's yeah, not being absolutely. Done absolutely. I even, I mean, I, I grew up in the 60s, you know, and, and stuff. And so, um, yeah, that was a, it was a sit down meal. You know, everybody, you had to wait till dad got home or whoever was. Exactly. Working. Yep. And, uh, you know. And if you tried to eat early, you know, you got bit, you no, got no, in trouble. No, no. Yeah, that, you got in trouble, right? <laughs> no, that didn't work. And then also I got an allowance, so I learned money. Mm -hmm. I could buy five comics with 50 cents in the 50s, but if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save. Yep, yep. So yep. I was learning that really young. Mm -hmm. And that's, these are not difficult things to do. Yeah. You know, some, some of the things are harder to do because they're not as available. Like, I, I mean, I, I had a paper route, but now, like, you know, people well, drive that's a not available. Paper route. Yeah. But what, yeah. what, what I used to say before COVID messed up, you know, uh, churches was um, get them to do a volunteer job when they're like 11 years old. They need to do something on a schedule where somebody else is the boss. Mm -hmm. You know, a task for some, you know, a farmer's market at a church, a neighborhood center, whatever. Mm -hmm. When they've got a little volunteer job, you start that at age 11. That's mm -hmm. about route, paper route age. Yeah. 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 I, I, that's, I got my exercise too. I rode my bike and 
I'd follow parents home to make sure I could get their money. <laughs> well, and I, we rode the bikes all over everywhere. And the, and the rule was don't go out a holler distance unless you're at, there were three houses where we could go without, you know, getting permission. They, yeah. His mother could call those three houses and then don't go out a holler distance. Yeah. What if your if your mom had a really strong voice, you could go a little further, right? So no, Yeah, know. she had a pretty strong voice, but it, it uh, <laughs> But I'm seeing too many kids now. I'm seeing too much handicap mentality. I'm seeing a 16-year-old good student in school who's never gone shopping by themselves. Yeah. I mean, this is just ridiculous. They aren't learning basic skills. Yeah. So they ask, well, what do we do now that, you know, um, you know, COVID's still going to have things restricted. Um, let's learn basic skills. Yeah. You know, well, Home Depot's right. doing a booming business. Yeah. People are working on home improvement. Because you've got a lot of kids today – that um, never use tools. Mm -hmm. I think that's ridiculous. I was using tools when I was in second grade. So was every other kid in the neighborhood. Now, obviously not power tools, but we were using hand tools and we were taught how to use them safely. Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I think that's absolutely, you know, using, using mechanisms that we can like understand, right? Levers, yeah. and, you know, hammers and you know, pulleys, whatever else you need to use and teach them those types of things, mechanical. But they're not, you know, kids, a lot of kids are not doing that. And, and uh, the video game playing needs to be restricted. You know, now, of course, school being on a device uh, and the way the lesson's done, they range from really good to really atrocious. Yeah. Same thing with the college lessons, too. So what do you, what, so have you heard of these things called like Minecraft and Roblox? And yes, I know. Yeah. And what, uh, what, what would you say about them? Like, would you say you could do them minimally, but, or you. No, could, I would allow an hour a day. They can do it for an hour a day. That's the same rule we had in the fifties for TV. Mm -hmm. It was an hour a day, two hours a day on the weekend. And okay. mother looked at what we were watching. Mm -hmm. And I uh, know today you've got grownups behaving so badly on TV that was something I did not see as a child. Yeah. It's just not exposed to that. Grownups behaved uh, pretty decently on TV. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you need to limit the video games. Now, one mom was really clever. Uh, her kid was a Minecraft kid. She went and got some bunch of two by fours cut up and had the kids sand them and paint them to have, two, to have Minecraft blocks in the driveway. <laughs> and her Good. autistic kid became the head of the neighborhood. See, that's a simple thing to do. And this is my book right here of all my childhood projects, calling all minds. Because you've got kids today that aren't even making a paper airplane. Yeah. Here's a little paper snowflake. That's one of the projects right there. I got a little <laughs> ripped. But we got kids today that aren't doing those simple kinds of things. Yeah. So, so you would, I mean, I, I think those are definitely aspects that we need to get them doing more of. I, I, I totally agree. I, how do, you, how do you just have the schools do that? The parents do that? Both do that? How, how would you sort of uh, approach that in terms of... Well, I mean, it's something that I think one of the worst things schools have done is taken out hands-on classes. Worst thing they ever done. Mm -hmm. We got a giant shortage right now of people in high-end skilled trades. Things like welders that can build things by reading drawings, plumbers, electricians, um, heating and air conditioning, and then auto mechanics and truck mechanics. And these jobs are not going to go away. We may get self-driving trucks. Somebody's got to fix them. Yeah. That's not going to go away. Yeah. There are, I mean, I, yeah, there used to be shop classes. and. Um, you well, know, I think classes. taking that stuff out is a gigantic mistake. Yeah. Okay, it's now moved to the community college. But for a lot of these kids, it's almost too late. Yeah. They need to get exposed to the stuff, of, you know, tools that are in grade school and doing some shop stuff um, Sixth grade, seventh grade, you know, around that time. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they haven't taken these uh, classes out in Germany and in Holland. And I, we're paying a price for that right now. I went to state-of-the-art poultry plant last year. They imported 100 shipping containers from Germany. Mm -hmm. No, Holland. I got mixed up. Holland for this one uh, for the, um, all the equipment. We're not making it anymore. We're losing skills on specialized things like food processing equipment. Wow. 
Um, tacking back a little bit to sort of um, smaller kids and stuff like that, how can schools um, transition back into situation where kids on the spectrum interact more with kids not on the spectrum? Do you think that there's a... Well, I had friends with shared interests. Of course, in the 50s, we were out in the woods building things, exploring. Well, that's something that all, of, all the kids like to do, making stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, friends who shared interests. When I, I, I managed not to get bullied in elementary school because my teacher explained to the other kids I had a disability that was not visible, like crutches or a wheelchair. And that in high school, I was bullied. It was just terrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got uh, kicked out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl who called me a retard. Mm -hmm. And the only place I was not bullied was shared interests, horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. So get kids involved in shared interest. It could be theater. Of course, that's all shut down now. Mm -hmm. Music, computer programming, robotics. It could be a lot of different th things. Friends through shared interests. I can't emphasize that enough. Excellent. So how do, how do you teach those people that are in those shared interests to be anti-bullies? Like how, how, what, is there any things that... Well, that a lot of the people, if they're in a, in a, a techie kind of shared interest, tend to have autistic traits anyway. Yeah. So they're going to be they're going to be just fine. Um, um, you know, there's been studies that have shown that um, autism goes up around the tech centers. Mm -hmm. That's a book that's come out by si Simon Baron Cohen on patterns. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, he did a survey of one of the European tech around the tech city, and there was more autism. Yeah, you, know, you have to have a little bit of autistic traits to program computers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you yeah, that that's true. I mean, we we see that all the time. Some people have yeah. you know concerns about like you know Elon Musk and uh, some other people that have these visual minds and stuff like that. They're able to do things. Well, the thing is, there's different kinds of you know. In my book, The Autistic Brain, I talk about the different minds. I'm an I'm an object visualizer. I think mm -hmm. in pictures. And then there's others that are more mathematical thinkers. There's mm -hmm. others that are more word thinkers. And I think we need to be taking the strengths and building on them. In fact, Daryl Treffert just died very recently. Mm -hmm. He's been a big proponent of this, of working on take the thing the kid's good at. I mean, I'm seeing kids that are like fourth grade, brilliant in math, and nobody thinks to give them advanced math books. Mm -hmm. Give them the old-fashioned math books, not this new stuff, the old-fashioned stuff. There's just all numbers. Right, right, right. And right. I'm... And see if they take off with it. Start showing them computer programming. I've talked to parents that were both programmers. Their kids like seven years old and the math whiz, and they didn't think to teach them programming. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. some of these kids can just take off on this stuff. Let's develop that skill. That's something they that can turn into a career. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have a son with autism, and um, – you know, one of his skills was he could do math and he could do algebra and stuff like that, but he really did not like computer programming. So, all right. Well, if he didn't like it, you see, but the thing is, you don't know until you try it. Now, I tried uh, programming Fortran when I was in college. Now, I'm really dating myself. Uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, but you don't know until you expose. Right. And I get asked all the time how to get in the cattle industry. I was exposed to it as a teenager. It's that simple. If you don't get exposed to something, you can't find out whether you're good at it or like it, or maybe find out you hate it. Right. But you wouldn't know your kid hated hates computer programming. It's not good at it until you expose them. Right. Okay, now I'm going to drop it. Now that didn't work. Mm -hmm. Let's, um, you know, maybe, you know, but usually they tend to be a math kid, an art kid, or a word kid. The word kids often love history. They love mm -hmm. facts. About, you know, they'll learn um, all the capitals of every, every state. Or baseball mm -hmm. statistics, they like that kind of stuff. Yeah, my son, my son liked that. He liked uh, learning people's names and their okay. date of births and things like that. Well, so it made it very uh, popular in school because he could remember their birthday and stuff. And how old is he? Now he's 25. So what's he doing now? He's working. Uh, he works in materials management because he's good with lists and checklists. And so he has to prepare the rooms for the surgeons. And okay. so we have to make sure they have all the things they need in their packages and stuff like that. So he's oh, he was one of the project search one. Then. Yes, right. How did you know that? Yeah, project search. And and that was a good program, but the problem is those jobs are filled up. We've got to like take this this concept and. Uh, um, you were talking about project search. 
so um, tell me tell me about what you know about Project Search because that is what my son went through and you said it's used up all those jobs now and stuff. Well, the problem is people have filled those jobs mm -hmm. and so we've got to like take this idea into other kinds of jobs, take the mm -hmm. same principle where in, you know, like setting up all the medical equipment, that's a very precise thing. You want somebody doing that that can do things very precisely. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so he was able to do the, you know, what I call materials management things, find the packages and do them very quickly and stuff. So he does that um, 20 hours a week and gets paid pretty well. Gets like $15 yep. an hour and stuff. So, um, so he's, he's, he, you know, he, he basically pays for his, uh, you know, he pays for his room in the house. He gets his own food. He does a lot of his own things by himself, has still has Good. a lot of trouble with language, but, um, but is working on it. it. You know, sometimes we wonder, you know, he, we see, it seems like he's easy to be taken advantage of. So how do you teach them those skills, how to not, you know, sort of get taken advantage of? Well, right now, I mean, I'm getting umpty ump jillion scam calls. I just yeah. have a rule now, phone solicitors, hang up. Yeah. Uh, you just have to make some rules. I just assume most of it's a scam. I had a guy call me the other night that may not have been a scam, but I said, I've got a rule, phone solicitation. I just consider all of it a scam now. Yeah. Don't deal with it and don't give out any information. Right. How, how I mean, do you, li you live alone and independently um, and, and, and um, did, did you ever figure out how you would figure out your limitations that way? Did you, was there a way to sort of measure that in terms of when you could live alone or because that's one of the things that a lot of the older kids, you know, were trying to figure out, can they live alone? Well, I think a lot of them, I think a lot of them um, can, uh, uh, you know, can live alone because when I was out working on these big, designing these big projects for large meat companies like Cargill, mm -hmm. I worked with skilled tradespeople, drafting people and machinery designer people that were either autistic, dyslexic or ADHD. Mm -hmm. And they had taken shop class in school. And they were living by themselves. But this goes back to teaching basic skills. Now, these people were 100% fully verbal, and they were probably more the Asperger type where there was no obvious speech delay. Mm -hmm. um, but I know a guy who had 20 patents that I worked with. He was as autistic as he could be, undiagnosed, of course. Mm -hmm. And he was living alone. Oh, yes. Well, he's, he's married, in fact. <laughs> So um, now, where, where insight into autism can help them is on the relationships. A lot of these people, yeah. their relationships were not all that, all that good. Yeah. So you they know, have that, trouble maintaining them or, or making them? Well, both. Both, um, both uh, making them and maintaining them. Mm -hmm. That's why I've got a book called Different Not Less, and it's 16 older people diagnosed later in life. Mm -hmm. And where the diagnosis helped them was on relationships. They all had jobs because they grew up in having childhood jobs. So mm -hmm. all these people were employed, but learning about autism definitely helped on their relationships. Just learning about what autism is. Well, yeah, and then learning why they're kind of different from other people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, you know, self-advocacy, like sort of understanding what autism is and understanding how it affects you, um, how do you think that's changing or how will it change over time? Well, understanding, um, fortunately, when I was first started, I had some people that corrected my social mistakes. I remember I criticized some welding and I said it looked like pigeon doo-doo. And an um, engineer pulled me into his office and explained that that's uh, not appropriate talk. I had to apologize and I should have come to him if there was a problem with the welding. He quietly, in private, told me what I should do. Okay. That's really important. So getting, getting advice or getting people to help you manage those professional relationships? Well, I'm just sort of teaching you. He told me, you know, I had to apologize for saying what welding looked like pigeon doo-doo. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had to apologize for that. <laughs> so did it, but it looked like pigeon doo-doo, right? <laughs> well, I didn't tell him he had good welding, but I apologized for the rude talk. <laughs> okay, so you, you kept it honest, right? You kept it honest. That's why I kept it honest, yes. You kept it honest. This is a question kind of for you. What, what do you think, what do you consider one of your greatest hurdles in your life? 
Well, actually, when I first started out in the feedlot industry in the early 70s, being a woman was a much bigger hurdle than autism ever was. Wow. Woman was a much bigger problem. Hmm. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where they put bull testicles on my vehicle. That actually happened. Wow. That's horrible. So, I, I mean, so part of me wonders, what, what, what did you find in yourself to get through that? Well, I um, made myself very good at what I did. And there's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really help. Mm -hmm. And I made myself really good at being livestock editor for that magazine. Started out with one article, and then I started writing a few more articles in a column, and then they made me livestock editor. Mm -hmm. I made myself really good at what I did. And then once I got the card, I delivered the work. And then another thing is I got my stuff in on time. And I'm seeing that as being a problem for a lot of kids today. Um, they're just not learning stuff like, you know, get the work done on time. Yeah. Now, I have problems with multitasking. I know that's executive function. But executive function, you say, oh, I'm an executive function. Problems, they can't get up in the morning. Well, I didn't have that problem. I had a lot of anxiety until I, all through college until I got on the medication. But I'm... Um, getting work done once I had decided to study. And that was my great science teacher when I was a teenager that got me motivated to study. Mm -hmm. I got the stuff done on time. Now, I do have problems with multitasking. I can't do that. It took me much longer to learn how to drive. 200 miles on dirt roads. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have a much longer period of practice in a really safe place and then very carefully venture out into traffic. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had an accident? I've had some fender benders. Some fender benders? Yeah, and I had, uh, well, there's two accidents I had, and they were not my fault. I got rear-ended on the freeway. Uh, that was definitely not my fault. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's interesting because um, I always worry about my son in terms of him driving because I have a feeling whenever he does something like that, he always says, it's, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And so everybody takes that as it must have been your fault. And so... Um, how, did, how, how, you know, how, how would you advise him just to sort of not say anything <laughs> or, you know, call well, me or what? I, first of all, uh, the, see, the reason why you need to have more practice to learn how to operate the car, because you've got to get that into motor memory yeah. before you go out onto the, uh, into traffic. You mm -hmm. see where you're on autopilot in terms of how to steer, gas, brake. That's on autopilot. And I actually learned on a very, very uh, balky, nasty manual transmission. Three on the tree, <laughs> constant stalling. But I practiced uh, out in the horse pasture. That's where I started. And then, then um, practiced uh, on dirt roads every day. Uh, I was on my aunt's ranch, and the mailbox was three miles away down a dirt road. So six days a week, I had six miles of driving every day just to pick the mail up perfect place to, to learn. Did you, did you have to pass a drive, like a, a driver's test? Yes, I did. And, um, it, and I failed my first one and I passed my second one. And fortunately I didn't have to parallel park. And the uh, <laughs> test was actually on the Fort Huachuca army base. And it was in the middle of the day and the traffic was really, you know, small. <laughs> do, do you still have trouble parallel parking? I can do it, but I, I am not that I can do it. <laughs> okay. Just, but these are things where you need to practice, 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 practice. A lot of these individuals need a lot more practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell parents, get in the middle of a gigantic parking lot where there's no light poles and just practice. Go out 20 minutes a day, every day, and practice. And then maybe venture out onto a dirt road or a side street somewhere. Go over the deserted office park. Nobody's there now. Yeah. Yeah. And even, uh, even before COVID or after COVID, Office parks are deserted on weekends. Yeah. They're good places to practice once you've done the parking lots. Mm -hmm. It's going to take longer because of the multitasking issue. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you tell parents about, um, I guess you, I, you're probably familiar with guardianship and things like that. So um, do, you, do you think that children with autism specifically, if they can live independently should, or if they are thinking about living, they should not do guardianship or, or do you well, absolutely i mean half of silicon valley's got some degree of autism i don't think they need guardianship they're some are running fortune 500 companies 
Okay. You see, this is the problem you've got with autism. You go with someone who's got some of the traits, you know, when you slap the label on them, it's yeah. not black and white. It's a continuous trait. Yeah. It's absolutely a continuous trait. And, and, um, and the, you see, the thing is, autistic kids keep learning. And I'm seeing so many autistic kids so sheltered, they're not getting the opportunity to learn enough stuff so they can live independently. Yeah. And I'm just a, kind of appalled at the amount of kids that aren't doing shopping. Like recently, I was at the airport. You know, that's maybe it's only almost a year ago I was at the airport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a mom came up to me with about a 12-year-old girl, fully verbal. She had never shopped. And I gave her a $5 bill. And I said, go on that newsstand and buy something. And she did. And she bought a drink and brought the change back to me. First time she'd shopped. Wow. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna. You know, the thing is, is that the autistic mind keeps learning, but you got to get them out there doing things, or they're not going to learn. So I, I think that's an, a critical point that that I've pointed out multiple times to my parents. Like they can always continue to learn. Um, they that's can right. Always that's right. Move forward. It's not. There's not like a you know this foundation that's never going to be able to be built on and stuff. It, it, they can always continue. That's to learn. right. And I, I agree with you. The repetition is really, 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 really important um, to keep repeating over and over those certain aspects like driving or doing things that are difficult for them. Do you think that's just related to developing those pathways in their brain or is it, is it well, related? Well, it's just going to take longer to learn, you see, because I, I, um, I have problems with interrupting conversations. I can't get the timing right. Mm -hmm. I, I can't uh, do, do multitasking. Mm -hmm. And by taking that long period of practice, then the driving goes into motor memory. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not multitasking. I, I put all the attention on the traffic because I don't have to think about steering. That's now in motor memory. Yeah. This is sort of another one of those questions I kind of, you know, thought question for you. What do you think was one of your greatest successes in life? Well, I, you know, I've had a number of different things. I've done a lot of things to improve um, animal welfare Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I got really happy when my trade, uh, the trade association, the American Meat Institute gave me the industry advancement award, you know, it was a number of years ago now, mm -hmm. you know, that show that was really accepted. Mm -hmm. That made me, you know, made me really happy. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of things that people always look for single breakthroughs. Now, there's important things all along, like Mr. Carlock, my science teacher. There was a contractor just starting his business that saw my drawings and seeked me out to sell and design jobs for him. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, there were people that were bad to me, but there also were people that were good to me, and they'd recognized my abilities. But the thing where I'm seeing, but things like shopping, I knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. I was taught how to handle money. I mean, these are things they're not getting taught now. Yeah. And, and, and things like shopping. I was a little kid when I was, I'd go buy comics and stuff. I was like seven and eight years old. Mm. I was a little kid. So uh, this is a, this is a question I always think is funny because I'm thinking what, what would, what could you, what kind of advice would you give to Temple yourself at age 18? And what would you tell her at that time? So like if you could, Talk to your 18-year-old self at 18. What would you tell her? Well, I, um, um, you know, all the anxiety I had, yeah. I had no idea to be a medication that could, you know, help that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that really motivated me when I was in my 20s is I wanted to prove to people I wasn't stupid. That yeah. was a huge, huge motivator for me. And those dip that projects shown in the movie are accurate. I did all the projects shown in the movie. Mm -hmm. And I was motivated. I wanted to prove to people I could do it, that I wasn't dumb, mm -hmm. that I really could do things. That was a big motivator. But I'm just seeing too much of a, a kids not learning enough skills because then you, you go, I go out to the tech companies. I see programmers there. I know they're on the spectrum. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting is they tend to avoid the labels. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Do you still have your um – Pressing machine or cattle? Press? I still have it. I haven't used it for ten years because it broke. I hadn't gotten around to fixing it. And, <laughs> and uh, they, uh, I was then hugging real people, but then COVID stopped that. 
Yeah. And uh, I haven't had done any traveling since March. Mm-hmm. And right now they're canceling out. All the January meetings are canceled in February. Yeah. I think it's going to be March before we do any traveling again. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's your day like? What's your day like now? Like, is it sort of? Well, it's get up in the morning and you know get up early, get dressed, I get breakfast, and then I've got a, a working on a new book on visual thinking. Okay. That's uh, you know taking up a lot of time. I've got scientific papers I'm writing. Got another book, uh, uh, animal behavior book that I'm updating. So I've got a whole lot of different things that I'm working on. Um, I've got. You know, I've got to have things to do. I've had a few design projects I'm working on. I've got one right now for a veterinary clinic. Mm-hmm. And I have to redo the drawing to fit the equipment that they've got. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, i got, well, I got to have stuff to do that's constructive. I've been doing lots and lots of uh, meetings on Zoom. Yeah. Do you, do you have a pet? Do you have a pet animal? Well, I didn't have a pet because I was traveling all the time. I was yeah. on the road 85, 90% of the time. Wow. Now, the thing is, you know, if I get a pet, I'm afraid the dog's going to be all separation stress when I have to leave. Yeah, that's true. And this is, a, the, the dogs think COVID's the best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> okay, more walks, more attention. Yeah. But the thing that's a concern is that when COVID finally gets over, mm-hmm. um, the dog is going to be getting separation anxiety. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of problems with uh, certain dogs don't like being home alone. And Yeah. So... You can kind of, do you feel like you can kind of visualize their anxieties? Well, yeah. And and I think a lot of dogs today are leading to restricted a life. When I was a child, all the dogs ran free. We got them in at night and we didn't have all the behavior problems we had now. Now there were quite a few killed by cars, but they had a better life. They got to go out and do doggy things. And I was just talking <laughs> to one of my friends I suggested that she take her dog somewhere where there's woods and stuff and she could let it off leash. I said, now watch what your dog does. And she said, that really opened up my eyes because I could see the things that my dog enjoyed doing, smelling everything. I said, a dog lives in a smell world. Yep. And I see people, you know, take the dog off a walk and wants to check the local tree and they're yanking it away. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's a dog's social life and you just <laughs> yank them away. <laughs> he just yanked them off of there. Yeah, and and uh, the uh, you know there's been more behavior problems like eating up the house bites. And I think a lot of it is they don't get out, get kind of they get kind of stir crazy, don't get enough exercise, um, I, I don't get out and do enough things, socialize mm-hmm. with other dogs, learn that little kids are people too. Mm-hmm. Almost sounds like dogs dogs are kind of have an autistic brain as well or something. I don't know. Well, I think they're having a lack of, uh, you know, restricted life brain. Yeah. And I think that's a problem with um, <laughs> some of these autistic kids. Also, noise phobias in dogs. We never had that when I was a child. Thunderstorm problems with dogs. We never had that problem. And I think some of the stuff is the dog isn't getting exposed to enough stuff. Mm-hmm. Do, you think, do you think it's beneficial for a child with autism to have a dog? Yes, for some of them, I think it could be very ben- beneficial. Mm-hmm. I've observed there's kind of three ways autistic kids react to dogs. Love them, at first sort of afraid of them, and then they love them. Mm-hmm. What- and then you have the kid where it's not appropriate because mm-hmm. of sensory problems. They're afraid it's going to bark, they don't like its smell or its drool or something like, you know, mm-hmm. some sensory feature of the, of the dog. Did, did you have pets growing up? I, for, I forget. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah we did. had... Um, we had golden retrievers and we also had uh, cats. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, I, I know we got a dog for our son and, and it was definitely very helpful because he didn't really know how to, you know, um, how to behave around them. You know, like it was, it was very helpful because um, initially he was a little bit too rough on him. You know, well, you have to, to teach him not him. to do that. You have to right, teach but him that not it to taught him how to be kind. Right. And taught That's him right. how to not, not hurt or, or hurt the dog. The dog, the dog still took, took their, you know, they were always a little careful around him because, you know, they, they knew that he could respond quickly and stuff. So yeah, that did help. In terms of, um, I know that COVID is taking up all of our things, but, it, you know, have you thought of like um, what your legacy will be? What kind of future you have, what future plans you have and things like that? What, well, what you- I want to do some going back out on the road, but I kind of have a feeling I don't want to do quite so much going back out on the road. Um, cause I was really realizing I'm getting kind of stressed out, um, you know, going on the road. I am getting older now 
which is also, you know, issue. Um, but the thing I really miss is just the, the casual, um, I can't just go over to the office and just um, chit chat colleagues over there. And mm -hmm. that's what most people seem to be really missing. Mm -hmm. You would think, I mean, a, a lot of the things about autism are about the social, social, socializing, but you're, you miss that. Well, yes, I definitely do miss that. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing I've learned on socializing is that I had to be taught. You can't go on and on talking about your favorite thing over and over and over again mm -hmm. because people are going to get bored with that. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did you stop? How, how? Well, one thing is I have a rule. When mm -hmm. I was in college, I had a rule that I can only ask two questions per class. Okay. I just make some rules. I can tell that story twice and then that's it with that person. Okay. So, is it, but how, how, I mean, I, I, it's always interesting because my, my son will talk about the same thing over and over again, but I don't know how to tell him you can only do that twice. Well, I had, you know, I had people tell me, I mean, I, yeah. one thing about the construction industry, people are blunt and they told me quietly, but they told me, you know, that, that I have to change. And there's a scene in the movie where the boss slams down the deodorant, that scene happened. <laughs> at the time I was upset, now I thank that boss. Okay. You know, rude, filthy, dirty slob. No, nope, that has to get cleaned up. Yeah. No, I like that. I, I like the fact that, you know, you know, if, if that can penetrate, meaning like, you know, you've told the story twice now, it's done for the day. You can't say it anymore. In, well, that's just it. You make it a rule mm -hmm. and you just, and then you explain that other people get bored hearing that over and over again. Mm hmm. Is it better for them? I mean, I feel like, is it better for them to just be quiet then and kind of have to sort of self think about what the next thing they should talk about? Well, or? the other thing that's hard for me in noisy social situations is I do have some auditory processing issues and I'm functionally deaf when there's a lot of noise. Yeah. And so it's not too fun listening to conversation um, when I can't hear it. Hmm. Also, there's a lot of chit chat conversation that I find really boring. And it's like happy chit chat with very little information in it. Right. I see. And I'm not that good at doing that. Um, I usually find that, you know, pets or the weather is, you know, pretty safe to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that though. So basically you're much better a one-on-one -on -one conversation like this, or if it's a, if it's a, it's more than two people, they're all, if they're talking about the same thing and it's stimulating, well, and I can do a group conference committee meeting where you take turns talking. Okay. And yeah, those I do just fine. And I've learned that, you know, you got to take turns. Um, the other thing, like when I design, do design jobs, I figure out exactly what the boundaries of the job are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get an idea of, you know, when I have to get it done. Mm -hmm clear guidance. Okay. Like when your son sets up the surgical stuff, there's very clear what he has to do. Right. And uh, there's certain sameness, you know, different operations may need different instruments, but there's, it's very clear exactly what the task is. It's not ambiguous. It's not vague. So, and, and this is one of the difficult parts about being a parent and seeing things and stuff is that, um, so he's really good at what he does and he's faster than anybody else. So yeah. therefore, some of them take advantage of him. And so instead of, he'll do like 15 cases and they do seven. So how do, how does he communicate that? Because he, uh, you know, he seems happy about it, but. Well, it's, there's a not, point, don't, but make sure you don't overload him. Right. Because then <laughs> his performance will go down. The other thing that can happen in some of these situations, other colleagues get jealous. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's another thing. Uh, and I was reading about a guy who was very good at finding fish. He could look at the surface of the water and tell where schools of fish were. And he was upset that, um, yeah, they liked to have him with them when they were fishing, but they weren't, he wasn't welcome at the pub. Mm. You know, and he noticed that. Um, you know, I, on a lot of things I designed, I used to do drawings really fast, mm -hmm. but I didn't let clients know about that. I would uh, sit on them for a few days before I sent them in. <laughs> you got to take a little more time. Yeah. I covered that up. But of course, in, the, in those operating in the hospital, there's no way to cover that up. But the thing is, there's a point, if they push him too hard, he's going to make a mistake. Yeah. And you need to step in there and find out how many operating rooms he can set up and put a limit on it. Yeah, it, it, that's where some of this gets into trouble because, you know, they don't like parents coming in, you know, if, if he's trying to be independent and he's trying to work. Yeah, but somebody needs to get that. That's yeah. gotten ridiculous. 
and yeah. you're going to have some screw up in an operation. Mm. There's a point as good as he is, he's going to overload. Yeah. Now I found working with the meat factories that when they push employees to do stuff fast, you mm. can push, 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 and then performance catastrophically drops. Yeah. And what they do when it catastrophically drops, they leave out a step. Right. No, that's mm. something where they need to be, that's getting to where uh, that could get bad. And, and they need to be looking at what can he actually do and do it accurately and not get too tired. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the mistakes. You know, this is really critical work. And there's a point where uh, th they could overload him and get into pile of trouble. Mm -hmm. So what I, I, this is a question that just came to my mind. So um, what do you think about job coaches? And, and did you ever have a job coach? Uh, the job coaches tended to be the people that were employing me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that was the job coaches I had. But you see, again, in our generation, you know, I, you know, I was taken in and counseled about the, you know, rude way I criticized welding. Mm -hmm. I, people just, and, and I was pulled aside in private quietly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, it, it's done in that way. It's much better than sort of you know, chastising you out in the open and stuff. So you appreciated that, I guess. Yeah. No, they did not do it out in the open. But I think the biggest problem is that uh, uh, kids are not learning lo enough life skills and enough working skills. Mm -hmm. Because no, I'm I seeing agree. a lot of kids with their parents, but all the emphasis on academics and nothing's done about life skills and working skills. And yeah. they don't have any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's um, the, the life skills are really important. And, you know, we're kind of like at that point and stuff. Um, I think we're oh, getting think close. That, um, yeah, we all got a few minutes left. So, um, um, did you have anything that you wanted to say at the end or any, any sort of final comments or final thoughts about um, COVID and autism? And well, the problem with autism, since they changed the diagnosis in 2013, you've got this huge spectrum that goes from uh, someone who can't dress themselves to somebody who's running a tech company. Yeah. <laughs> you see, this, this is the problem. And um, I want to mention on some of the nonverbals, some of them can learn to type independently. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's about four cases now that I know of that are ver absolutely verified that type independently. And you find out that they've got a disordered sensory world. Um, they can't control their movements. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing on desensitizing to loud sounds has been some real successes with um, uh, having the child control the sound. Let's say it was the hairdryer or the vacuum cleaner. You let the kid turn it on and off where they control it. Right. And then sometimes they can get to tolerate a sound they don't like if they control it. Another little hint with little kids, wait, give them time to respond. They're like a computer that loads slowly. Give them time to respond. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that's another little um, tip that might be helpful. Because um, I, you know, it, you know, because I still have got some, you know, problems with multitasking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna um, end there because I think uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for allowing us to to do this um, over the over the internet and virtually and stuff like that.